today is the, uh, is the 23rd meeting of this group um, and today we're going to be looking at some ICI case studies. Um, we're really lucky today to be joined by Sarah Lewis, who's an advanced specialist biomedical scientist at NHSBT, and her colleague Nikki Wilkes, who is a consultant clinical scientist trainee, also specialising in RCI. So um, without further ado, I'm going to allow um, Nikki and Sarah to come in and start their session. Um, over to you guys. Thanks, Danny. Thanks for the lovely introduction. So, yeah, we're going to talk to you guys today about three different case studies that we have come across in RCI. Um, so, if we start start off with just a little bit of background um, as to what we do in RCI. So, um, within an RCI lab, we handle hospital reference investigations. We handle quite a lot of antenatal reference investigations. Um, we do ABO incompatible transplant investigations. We do phenotyping and genotyping and basically anything else that comes in as like a reference referral from a hospital transfusion lab. So it's worth knowing that what starts out as um, what we think is going to be a relatively simple investigation request, it might not always uh, stay that way and that it's not just antibodies to high frequency antigens that can require provision of rare red cell units. So a standard RCI investigation, um, an antibody investigation, consists of two ABO and RHD groups. So a full RHD, um, a full RH and K phenotype, if this is already unknown, if this is the first time we see the referral. Um, a BioRad IAT panel plus an own cell, a BioRad enzyme IAT panel, um, and this is obviously uh, sample permitting. So, so long as we receive sufficient sample, we can perform all of those investigations. So dependent on reactions obtained, if there aren't any reactions obtained, then no atypical antibodies detected. However, the majority of the referrals we do get through um, yes, there are reactions that are obtained and we obviously then need to go on to assess any reactivity patterns and to use our detective work to determine the next steps for the investigation. So, again, it's worth highlighting that the serological intuition of RCI laboratory staff is often needed to be called upon for these complex cases. So if we go on to talk about case one. Sorry, I'm going to pass over to Sarah to introduce case one. Um, okay. Thank you. So case one, so we had a referral from a 36 year old antenatal patient. So first sample in pregnancy was received at 28 weeks. So routinely your initial uh, testing for antenatal samples occurs in early pregnancy, around 10 to 16 weeks was a booking sample. So this was quite a late booker. Um, she had no previous antenatal history with us and nothing noted on the referral. So initial testing performed. So we did an ABO group, a D group, an RHNK phenotype and an antibody investigation um, by RAT and enzyme IAT um, using our automation. So initial results. Um, this patient group as group B negative. And the RHNK typing was big C pos, little C neg, Big E neg, little E pos. So, spot anything unusual? Anybody fancy posting a comment? No? Okay, we'll carry on. So, okay, so the patient is, yeah, we've got a comment from her, yeah. So, the patient is a probable R prime, R prime. So why do we say probable? We can never be certain unless we've got uh, the genotype. So it's a best guess aligned with the population genetics of a given population. So in terms of how common this is, the frequency you can see on our um, trusty RH calculator is 0.0097% of the given population. So they're really not common at all. 
Okay, so we've got all our initial test results for this patient. Um, so our antibody investigation results showed that there was an anti-little c was detected um, by IAT and enzyme IAT. And this anti-little c, we, um, it went on the antibody quantification platform and this was quantified at 0 0.3 international units. So I've put a picture there, the very complicated um, rapid flow analyzer that we use for antibody quantification. Um, so the clinical significance and clinical advice attached to um, this result and this level of antibody is that HDFN is unlikely when anti-little C level remains below 7.5 international units. So this is fairly low at this level, 0.3, but we would recommend in line with BSH guidelines that um, to repeat the testing every two weeks until delivery as this patient's already surpassed the 28 week mark. And we would also recommend paternal phenotyping and or fetal phenotyping. So in addition, um, with this patient being D negative, we've also add the advice that the patient should receive antenatal and postnatal anti-D prophylaxis. Okay, so when this case um, came to reporting, um, as well as reporting the results to the hospital, we also liaised with our medical department internally to make them aware of the case. The reason we did that is that this patient has a rare RH phenotype, so there may be issues with blood provision. By giving the medical department notice, we can arrange for suitable donations to be sourced nearer to this patient's delivery date to ensure a supply of units in case um, they're needed. As the patient's already sensitised and had one antibody, they could potentially produce another one. And if they made more bulk provision, it would become more problematic. So this early, early notification is really important in cases like these. So subsequent sample was received at 35 weeks. So the antibody panel results for this patient. So we can still see we had a little C pattern present, but we also had an extra reaction there. So as we've got an anti little C present in the plasma, we can use an, another panel, a um, panel of R1R1 cells. So we don't pick up the anti little C to see what the additional reaction might be. So the R1R1 antibody panel results. So as you can see, we have a stronger reaction with the lone C, little c pos cell on the panel, but all the other cells are positive. So all these cells show weaker reactivity, but it looks like it's another antibody, but it's fairly uniform. So it looks like it's all the same antibody. So what do all these cells have in common? They're all D positive she could have an anti-D. So added information, the patient had got no recent history of any anti-D prophylaxis that had been given. So we need to be able to understand what these reactions can be attributed to. So how do we distinguish between the antibodies that are present and how can we prove these specificities? So we would utilize an absorption technique um, and in simple terms, the absorption enables us to detect um, individual antibody specificities by separating them out. So we would use paired enzyme treated cells with opposing phenotypes. Um, and these are reagents that are provided to us um, within the RCI lab. So we're all using standardized cells. So we have an R1R1 phenotype cell and a little r little r phenotype cell. And by using the R1R1 cell, we can remove the anti-D and leave remaining the anti-little C. And then by using the little r, little r cell, we can remove the anti-little C and leave the anti-D. So it might be better explained um, in terms of a diagram. So this, this is just highlighting how we do in the serial absorption. So we can see on the left hand side, we've got the patient's untreated plasma, which will undergo two different serial absorptions, one with the plasma with the R1R1 cell, one the plasma with the little r, little r cell. And these are incubated at each step, spun down, and then at the end we have our absorbed plasma. 
So we're absorbing using two different aliquots, two serial absorptions. So once we perform the absorptions, we would then tunnel the absorbed plasma right using the same um, antibody panel. And we need to use this absorbed plasma to prove the presence of an anti D. So we can see here that the red is highlighting the presence of an anti little C, and then the yellow is highlighting the presence of um, an anti D, albeit fairly weak anti D. So then we need to quant using both channels on our quant. So by that I mean our antibody quantification machine is capable of quanting anti-D and anti-little c using two, two separate channels of machine. So we would run the patient's plasma using both sides of the machine to enable measurement of both of these antibodies separately. So the investigation results and advice given now, we have got anti-little c, which is quantitating at 0 0.4 international units and anti-D, which is quantifying at 0 0.1 international units per mil. So in line with BSH guidelines, the anti-little C level, um, HDFM remains unlikely when the anti-little C remains below 7.5 international units per mil. And then the anti-D, um, we have to assign the, the um, specificity as not specified because we, we haven't got any prophylaxis information that was provided. So this is safest for the patient for us not to state it's due to prophylaxis when we are uncertain that if that is the case. So there's obviously a potential, although it's very weak antibody, it could still be an alloantibody that's obviously significant. So sorry, we've just seen in the chat, we've got um, why is sulfur negative for the little C antigen? Shall we go back to that? So, yeah, Sarah's saying that's the heterozygote. So um, the, it's obviously coming through fairly weakly um, as to why it's negative. So we've got two plus reactions with the homozygote, but we could pop up another heterozygote on another panel and potentially uh, on another panel, sorry, and potentially get it rea reacting as a one plus. So it's it's sort of looking at all of the results sort of all, all together and just the one cell in isolation. But thank you for that comment. So that's a, it's a really valid comment as to why sometimes these heterozygote expressions can be negative. Um, so sorry, back to just the, the clinical advice that um, the advice that we were given associated with this sample was to repeat every two weeks until delivery. Like I say, she's already passed the 28 week mark. And then at delivery to perform the core DAT and monitor the baby's HB and bilirubin. We would still recommend paternal phenotyping and or fetal genotyping and that the patient should continue to receive antenatal and postnatal prophylaxis whilst we haven't got that information around whether this is allo or um, not specified antibody due to prophylaxis. OK, so on to um, what our report looks like. So it's fairly wordy with all the different sections on the report when it's complex cases like this. So what we are highlighting here, if, I'm not sure if you can actually read, but the, there's a section at fairly close to the bottom that states the blood selection. Um, and we are stating that in view of the difficulty in finding the blood of this phenotype, we're requesting as much notice as possible if blood is requested, um, especially to, to sort of cover for delivery. And that also um, we've got information that the partner had grouped as um, A, D positive, and that the partner was also positive for the little c antigen, um, which obviously the we, we've got that maternal antibody for. And it's just worth noting as well that no samples were received for fetal genotyping throughout this pregnancy. So closer to um, the patient CDD, we did a search for liquid units that match the appropriate phenotype. We had three liquid units in stock. Um, so we went to look at our frozen stocks, which are held by our National Frozen Blood Bank in Liverpool. And we had 15 of those. But being as this was, um, we had time, we'd identified this early, we could go through a special donor call-up procedure um, to um, identify donors. So 
In prep for delivery, a rare blood letter was sent to the hospital to advise of the patient's rare blood type and if the blood was required, we'd need advance notice if at all possible. Um, our current donor appointments were searched by our medical department and suitable donors were identified and their appointments were protected. And then three suitable donations were collected, put on hold and transported to um, an HSBT in Birmingham once they were processed to be put in um, reserve for this patient. So at delivery, the red cell units were held at NHSBT Birmingham in case they needed to be cross-matched and sent out. Um, but in the event, no blood was required for mum or baby and uh, there was a successful delivery. Okay, so any questions for that or are we happy to go on to case two? Okay, we'll carry on to case two then. Okay. OK, so um, case two, this is another antenatal patient, 29 year old antenatal patient. Uh, first sample was received earlier for this patient at 17 weeks gestation. We have got no previous antenatal history on our limb system and the initial testing was performed, the ABO group, the D group, RH and K phenotype and the antibody investigation on our automated technique by means of IAT and enzyme IAT. So our initial results for this sample, we got um, the patient as group B positive and we got them as R1 little r k neg. And then the initial panel results, hope you can see on, on the screen, we've got pan reactivity in our IAT panel and we've got a completely clear enzyme panel. But do you notice anything about um, this panel, that we've got this PAM reactivity, that there's something that would automatically make us think, oh, what, some, something, something else is going on here? When we normally see PAM reactivity, we think, we think, oh, awesome antibody. But yeah, I can see we've got an answer. To that. So, Obviously, alarm bells start coming when we've got to come back to the next. So what, what are we doing? What's going on? So we've got results obtained indicating the presence of an of, 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 not an autoantibody, sorry, of an alloantibody to a high frequency antigen. So a high frequency antigen is classed as an antigen that is found in more than 99% of any given population. So what do we do next? we um, look at the reactivity panels for any clues. So we've got this uniformity about the pan reactivity. We can perform phenotype and we can also gain some clinical information to help us. So I can see in the, in the, um, in the chat, we've got a question mark monoclonal drug. So yeah, we, we definitely see in terms of like daratumumab, we get that pan reactivity. So possibly, possibly some drug interference as well. The different options as to what's going on, but obviously clinical information can help quite a lot. So in cases like these, looking at the reactivity pattern can give you clues as to what the antibody specificity might be. So looking at what we already know, the antibodies are reacting by biorad IAT and by list tube IAT, but it's not reacting in the enzyme IAT. So whatever it is, um, this antigen is enzyme labile. So we can't pick it up with the enzyme um, results. So that's a big clue as a starting point. Also, another clue, you're looking at uniform reaction strengths rather than a variety of varying reaction strengths, which makes you think it's one antibody as opposed to a mixture of antibodies that might have different strengths in different cells. So, um, with all these cases, the next thing we do is we do um, a full phenotype. So we did a red cell phenotype and we look for things that some of the more common um, antigens for high frequency antibodies, such as Lutheran B, KPB, but they were both positive. There was nothing, no indicators on the, the common red cell phenotype. Um, we did try and um, obtain some more clinical information, but there wasn't really um, anything else we could find out other than what came on the, the initial referral, which was very little. At this point, it would have been useful to know the patient's ethnicity. Can it help, it can help down narrow, narrow down, sorry, the list of suggestions for the antibodies. And I'll show you a little bit about that now. 
So this is just a selection of high frequency antigens that are absent in certain populations. So um, the ATA negative phenotype is, is more common in, in black populations. Um, the ENA negative TS is Finnish, then Canadian, then English to Japanese. It just gives you an indication that some of these um, negative, high frequency negative phenotypes are more common in certain populations. So it can point as an indicator. It's all information about how ethnicity can, when combined with everything else, can help narrow down a potential list of high frequency antigens and antibodies um, to help you work out what the antibody might be. And it's also some are enzyme sensitive, some are not enzyme sensitive. So again, it, it's about putting all the pieces of the puzzle together to try and work out what you might be looking at. So we did some more testing. The patient's D18 was negative. So we put that up even though the M cell was negative just to make sure that there was nothing that we couldn't pick up on the monospecific that we hadn't picked up before. We also used a panel of a DTT treated red cells that was also negative so chemical treatment of red cells works a lot like enzymatic treatment of red cells so depending on whether the antibody was positive or negative with those cells that can be another indicator so putting all these pieces of information together and we also have access to a rare cell panel so it's a panel of um, red cells that are negative for certain high frequency antigens and we also have a couple of indicator cells on there in the form of um, cord cells and an in lieu cell so those are cells that are weakened for certain antigens and come up stronger with other antibodies so again it's all indicators so all the results when put together indicated the presence of a possible anti-IMB but Unfortunately, we were unable to confirm the specificity due to lack of reagents. So we referred this to IBGRL. So red cell reference to IBGRL. So IBGRL is the International Blood Group Reference Laboratory. So they are the reference lab for reference labs. They deal with cases from all across the world. So they, they are the people that take on the investigations where we can't work out what the antibodies are or what's there. So they have an extensive reference cell and antibody collection for use in antibody investigations. And they have an extensive reagent collection that includes enzymes, chemicals, recombinant proteins to help identify antibodies. So their investigation process. So they will initially start off with a three cell screen and they'll also test two group O phenotype match cells to the patient. And they'll do a, patient, a cell which is the same ABO group of the patient if the patient isn't group O. They'll test an autologous cell and these are all tested by LIS IAT, enzyme IAT and saline room temperature techniques. The cell selection is influenced by the amount of plasma and serum supplied and by the information given by the referrer. So all these things are taken into account and the investigation is planned meticulously before any testing is, is started at all. So they're looking for things like, are reactions stronger by any one technique? Um, is the antibody enzyme enhanced? Is it temperature enhanced? Is there any evidence of enzyme sensitivity? Are the reaction strengths consistent or variable? Are there weak reactions with certain cell types or is there any hemolysis present? So if the reactions are stronger by any one technique, it can indicate um, a preference whether it's IgG, IgM. Evidence of enzyme sensitivity can point you in direction of certain blood group systems. Reaction strengths consistent or variable. You could have a mix of antibodies there. So you could have a high frequency plus something else underneath it and it's being, it's being hidden. Are there weak reactions with certain cell phenotypes? Um, again, it can point you in certain directions for certain blood group systems and hemolysis present. Hemolysis can be characteristic of certain antibodies, like anti-H or anti-Lewis antibodies. So again, it's all pieces of information that inform a puzzle. So next steps. So antigen screening. 
phenotyping. So they have a, an extended range of phenotyping. So we've done, we would have done the common red cell antigens uh, in RCI. They will go on and do the less common ones. And they'll put up their high frequency antigen negative cells and their null cells. They'll do enzyme panels of certain of different enzymes. So we only have access to one type of enzyme panel here. They can use um, four or five different types of enzyme treated cells to see what their reaction strengths are, whether they are different. Uh, they can also use recombinant proteins to inhibit reactions, see whether they can inhibit uh, antibody reactivity. And certain recombinant proteins will inhibit reactions for certain antibodies and blood groups. They can also do elution studies um, on the patient to see whether that may help. But the serological expertise and the experience of the staff plays a massively important role in guiding the investigation and uh, when they're coming to their conclusions. So, um, red cell reference at IBGRL confirmed the presence of the anti-IMV that it suspected. So, just a little brief bit about IMV. Um, it's an antibody to a high frequency antigen of the Indian blood group system. And the occurrence is 99% in Caucasians, 96% in South Asian Indians. And it's capable of causing severe and delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. So it's one that we really do need to be concerned about. In terms of HDFN, there's no evidence published that there's any clinical consequence of HDFN. But it may cause a positive DAT. And obviously, just because there's a lack of evidence, that doesn't mean that it's not something we need to be concerned about. So what next? What do we do next in terms of this patient? So we need to look at what the current stocks are. So current stocks held in NFBB, so this is our frozen blood bank. We have got 12 suitable units. So for, um, appreciate this is a fairly busy table. It's highlighting all the different um, the different typings that they've got in NFBB, but that arrow is pointing towards the 12 suitable units for this patient that we've got. But logistics would potentially reduce this pool of units further um, due to the shelf life. So we've got that there are some that are, contain 24 hour shelf life potentially for this patient. So. What have we got next? Um, the preparations for delivery for the patient. So the hospital requested two units of cross-matched IMB neg red cells in preparation for delivery by C-section. So this was discussed with the on-duty and HSBT consultant, who then liaises with the consultant haematologist at the referring hospital. So the plan was to avoid transfusion with it being elective C-section and to use PBM measures um, to, to avoid that necessarily, that, that need to, to uh, thaw out the IMB neg units. Um, the plan was to use ABO, RH and K-matched red cells to cover the procedure if required. So this was a low risk delivery. Um, and the IMB neg red cells were not supplied due to the likelihood of use and the rarity of the stock. So obviously this decision may have been different if it was like a more high risk, um, high risk birth. So at delivery, um, as an on-call request, RCI did provide two um, group RH and K matched red cells to cover the procedure. But there was no further ongoing need for any blood. So moving on to case three. Okay. So case three. So we have a 31 year old antenatal patient. So we had a first sample of the current pregnancy was received at 11 weeks gestation. So this uh, patient was known to us and she was in her fifth pregnancy. This uh, patient had previously had a mixture of clinically significant allo antibodies. So she'd previously known to have an anti D, an anti M, an anti big S an anti-FYB and an anti-JKB. And in her previous pregnancies, she'd had high levels of anti-D that were over 15 international units per mil. 
even though she was in her fifth pregnancy, unfortunately, she'd only had one successful pregnancy previously, and this required multiple IUTs to see her through to term. So initial testing performed. So we did the ABO group and the D group. And in this case, we did the antibody investigation by IAT and enzyme using manual techniques. Um, we did this manually um, because this patient had previously had a high level of anti-D, there's a risk of carryover on the automation. So over um, a level of 50 international units, um, all our invests, antenatal invests are done manually. So there's no risk of carryover. So not even the groups um, or the RHs get done on the automation. Everything is tested manually. So the antibody panel results. So you can see we've got um, a mixture of positives and negatives. And we've got also cells that are positive by IAT and negative by enzyme. So if we're looking at the negatives, there's a few antibodies that we can exclude. And the extra negatives in the enzyme column help us differentiate between the antibodies. So we can see the anti-D at the top is still present. And then down here, we can see we've got a mixture of cells that are positive by IAT. Some are still positive by enzyme, others are not. So we can see we can differentiate between the antibodies that are there. So we've got the M and the S present. We've also got the JKB present in the enzyme. And then so subsequent antibody panel results. Again, we're looking to prove the presence of antibodies individually and the, to exclude all other antibodies to make sure that, the, that she hasn't developed any new antibodies. So we did the two panels initially and then further cells were needed to prove um, all the existing specificities that we knew were there. So the antibody investigation results. So this patient had an anti-D which um, quanted at 78.8 international units per mil. And then she still had the anti-M plus S plus FYB and JKB, but they were all too weak to teeter. So the clinical significance and advice that goes um, with these results is that there's a high risk of HDFN due to anti-D as the maternal anti-D level exceeds 15 international units per mole, which is the, the, high, the beginning of the high risk level. But there's a low risk of HDFN due to the M, the S, the FYB and the JKB as they're all too weak to teeter. But we would put the caveat in that combinations of antibodies can increase the risk of HDFN. So we would repeat testing every four weeks until 28 weeks and then every two weeks until delivery as per BSH guidelines. And we'd recommend paternal phenotyping and or fetal genotyping. We also report the results to the NHSBT clinician. And then they get referred to the fetal medicine department of the hospital and the high levels of anti-D will drive a request for a Doppler scan. OK, so the clinicians from the FMU at the referring hospital and the NHSBT on call consultant decided that the best thing for mom and baby was to begin IUT therapy at 17 weeks. So this was taken into account, obviously, the, the high risk um, with the previous pregnancy and the fact that she had ha only had one uh, successful pregnancy previously. So this 17 weeks is important. This is much earlier than um, both previous pregnancy and than what is guided through um, both Green Top Royal College guidelines and BSH guidelines. But it was felt that this, this MDT decision um, in relation to this patient was safest. So all clinical information was considered, taken into account the previous pregnancies, um, earlier than previous pregnancies. This, the, these decisions were all made to protect the baby and prevent this potentially fatal HDFN um, and hydrops occurring. So the request was received by RCI for one unit of IUT. So um, a little bit of interaction now from you guys. Can we list all the specifications for a red cell unit that's suitable for IUT? 
can pop it in the chat. We'll give give everybody a minute for some of these suggestions to come through. And just say there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen that we've got. So radiated, seeing V neg, seeing V neg, radiated. Yeah, they are definitely two that are on that list. HBS neg. Yeah. Radiated, K neg, yeah, fresh, yeah. And five we've got a bit of a difference of opinion, less than ten days, less than five days. We've got little R, little R. So the matacrits, yeah, I think we've got quite a range there. By T to neg. I think oh wow, we've got lots of lots of answers. This is great. <laughs> Okay, not first time donor. So if we, yeah, th thank you for the um, the interactive element. So we've got on our list group O or ABO identical with fetus. We've got RHD matched, big K neg. So why why do we say RHD matched and not RHD neg? Just out of interest, does anybody? So there's a particular situation where we would we would not need it to be RHD neg for IUT. Maternal antibodies, mom's antibodies. Yeah, so we need to take into account, brilliant, anti-little C. We need to take into account if there's an anti-little C present, we would definitely not want to be giving units that express that double dose potentially of the little C. Thank you. Right, so moving on, the rest of, the rest of our list, we've got K-neg. I think all of these have come up now in the list. So a uh, negative for antigen to maternal antibody. We've got irradiated. That was a popular one in the chat. Hematocrit 0.7 to 0.85. High T to neg. B and V neg. HBS neg. Less than five days old. We've got CPD, so no SAGM. So that's, will anybody know why we, we say not SAGM? So we've got this potential toxicity associated with the mannitol in the SAGM. Um, so then the last one, we've got pants neg, so that's the paediatric antibody negative. So ideally from male donors, and in addition, we would want this IUT to be cross-match compatible by IAT with the maternal plasma. So this is what we did. This is all obviously in accordance with BSH and Green Top Guidelines. So a total of nine IUTs were performed um, over a period of four months. So this is this is extensive. Um, this obviously was a high a high risk case. And uh, we've got FMU involvement with NHSBT all the way throughout. So that communication between both both the labs at the hospital transfusion lab and RCI is important, um, and also that consultant to consultant um, co uh, communication is important. Uh, we've got anti-D quantification and the MCA Doppler results. Um, Non-standard units were required for IUT due to the antigen negative requirements. And um, we did initiate the NHSBT special call-up for suitable rare blood donors to be identified. And I know that one of these was particularly difficult. It was across the Christmas and New Year bank holiday period. But uh, because of that special call-up, how great um, the team are, we've managed to get two donors across that bank holiday period as well for this. Um, and the, the graph here just illustrates um, the levels of anti-D throughout the pregnancy and where those IUTs will actually carry out and what, what that did to the levels of anti-D. So we've got, in relation to this case, at 31 weeks gestation, the patient transferred to a different hospital. So this just further um, clarifies the fact that it's, it's essential for communication across the FMUs um, and the FMU unit at the new hospital was made well aware of the case and the close monitoring continued. So the MCA Doppler scans were performed at, um, at these intervals that are listed here and that the Doppler results were all within normal range, which was obviously great news for mom and the baby or the teams involved. So our results were reported to the NHSBT clinician, the, re the referring hospital blood bank and the uh, fetal medicine departments. The initial high levels of anti-D drove these requests for the Dopplers. 
Do NHS BT now freeze these rare matched with donors as PD packs? So no, we, we wouldn't, um, but the additional secondary processing would happen after the unit is thawed out. Thank you for that question though. Um, so at delivery, the baby was born at 33 weeks, um, weighing four pounds, six ounces. Um, the initial treatment, oh, sorry, Sarah, I'm going, I'm talk, talking, uh, talking on Sarah's bit here. But the initial treatment for baby post delivery, and uh, we've got an excerpt from the guidelines here, that after delivery neonates with HDFN, following IUTs may become anemic and require additional monitoring for these several weeks. So they're still obviously high risk babies. Um, and babies who have who required several IUTs are at particular risk. This baby has required nine different IUTs. All babies who've had IUT require admission to the neonatal unit for early phototherapy and investigation for ongoing hemolysis or anemia. Sorry, I can't speak. Okay. So treatment post-delivery for the baby. Phototherapy. So phototherapy is the preferred treatment for HDFN causing jaundice. It's the least invasive treatment for the baby. So you can see um, babies in an incubator underneath the phototherapy lamp. They also have what they call um, billy blankets. So they have um, a fluorescent blanket that the, that the baby lies on so they can get um, the light from both, both sides to help break down that, um, those waste products that have been removing. Uh, intravenous immunoglobulin so that reduces the need for exchange transfusion when it's used as it conjugates the free bilirubin in the circulations um, before it deposits and starts to cause problems and then exchange transfusion so these are indicated if the bilirubin level is over 200 milligrams per deciliter so you cross match appropriate units against the maternal plasma due to the multiple allo antibodies present um, the Exchange packs, the PD packs, have um, very similar uh, requirements as to the ones we've just listed for the IUTs. The hematocrit level is slightly different, um, but they're very, very similar. Um, um, we can also do a double exchange, which is where we exchange twice the whole blood volume of the infant. So if we do this in one shot, then it reduces the need for further exchange transfusions um, further down the line for the baby. Uh, so in this case, uh, the phototherapy, the IVIG and the exchange transfusion were all used and it led to a decrease in the conjugated bilirubin level in baby in the days following the birth. So we had some communication with the hospital transfusion laboratory in the days following birth um, and in collaboration with the transfusion practitioner and some of the other lab staff we gained um, some blood results on the baby in in the days following birth just to sort of graph here and we can see what's going on with the baby's haemoglobin and with the baby's bilirubin and we've highlighted on the graph where um, the exchange transfusion occurred and we can see that it, it, it does um, ensure that the bilirubin is coming down it takes it takes sort of a matter of um, days for that to do so and the haemoglobin staying sort of fairly constant um, after these follow-up results, um, there was no further communication and the baby did actually recover and was um, discharged from hospital, I think approximately two weeks following delivery. So that was obviously great, great news and a total team effort. So the learning points associated with all of the cases we've discussed with you guys today um, that complex investigations can be very difficult and time consuming to resolve, but obviously very re rewarding as well. Uh, that patient's phenotype and ethnicity can be a, a useful indicator, especially for antibodies to high prevalence antigens, if that's one of the suspected um, things going on in the sample. And that the serological intuition of the RCI laboratory staff is often needed to be called upon. And it's a skill that's developed through experience of dealing with these cases day in, day out um, over the years of experience that the staff have got in the lab. And blood provision may be difficult um, and there may be significant delays in terms of um, resourcing from NFBB in Liverpool or in terms of instigating that uh, special donor call-up procedure. 
Um, so to be aware of that, and I can't highlight this last point enough, that effective communication and teamwork between the laboratory staff at the um, hospital transfusion laboratory and RCI and the clinicians, both in HSBT and at the referral hospital, is so essential, especially with complex serological cases such as these. So thank you so much for um, allowing us both to talk through our cases with you today. Um, pop our names on there and we can provide our emails if, you, if you've got any further questions. I think have we got a few minutes for any questions if they've arisen throughout. I think we've answered a couple as we've gone through, but appreciate the, um, the interactive element that, uh, that you've added to our case today. And thank you very much. Thank you, Nikki and Sarah. Uh, really, really, really interesting presentation. Uh, huge audience as well. I think we have about 175 in the audience today. So thank you to, to you as well for, for a very engaging session. Um, we do have about seven or eight minutes that we can use if we have any questions. Um, so I will invite um, anybody to raise their hand and, and come in with a question. Um, first, Rebecca Tizard. Clapping. I thought I was oh, clapping. Was that... <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay. I was trying to copy the we clapping. Like, we like clapping, thank you. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> sorry. So if you've got any questions, also feel free to use the chat function. I'll pick them out and I will um I'll read them out for you. As it stands on. So if, you, if you've got any questions, any questions later on, then if you feel feel free to email either of us or yourself, Danny. That's yeah, question. absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I've uh, got one for Martin. Yeah. Yeah, hello. Yeah, my work at Royal Papworth. We see quite a lot of um, solid organ transplants where the ABO group and D groups not quite identical. So I noticed in your very first slide you said you do deal with ABO incompatible transplant investigations. So my question is, how often do these ABO non identical transplants raise sensitization issues? That need to be referred to you? Um, we we tend to deal with them for um, the unrelated um, organ donor matching program so these tend to be for us um, either kidney transplant patients or BMT patients that are having a ABO mismatched graft and we monitor the um, anti-A and the anti-B levels for them. So that's where we come into for that. Um, in terms of um, ABO discrepancies, um, we don't see many that are associated with solid organ grafts um, very often and a lot of them tend to have um, transfusion complications in that they have been recently transfused due to whatever condition the patient has, so they're not always easy to resolve. Mm. Yeah, no, we don't usually have sort of complications, but um, yeah, I was just wondering why there aren't more. Is the patient just because of the normal immunosuppression suppresses any sensitization, or is it because the organs are so well flushed um, beforehand, you don't get any contaminating lymphocytes? It's just a query I've been having, that's all. I, I'm I sort think of hoping for more information. Like you say, it's it's a number of factors. It's that the, all these patients are screened, they're already on um, immunosuppression therapy and there's the procedures with the organs as well. Um, in terms of sensitization levels, we do an initial baseline screen when they get identified and then that's used to inform um, going forwards. Ah, oh, right, okay. In terms of um, our renal transplants, certainly, and the BNTs. Yeah, no, normally the transplant centre will have their own uh, cutoff, dependent yeah. on um, like the drug regime that, that they're using, like dependent on column, etc. But just mm -hmm. in terms of like, the, there are a couple of sets, I think, of clinical guidelines on our hospitals and science website in relation to uh, post uh, transplant patients that may may be of interest if um, 
that resource is obviously free, freely available as well. But like Sarah says, it, it tends to be like the, the teachers in the in the pre transplant workup that that we do tend to see. But any obviously any queries with post transplant discrepancies, it would depend on whether they're in that pre engraftment, post engraftment stage. And there's obviously ev every day there's your um, either your RCI or your patient facing consultant um, that that's available for any advice relating to any sort of difficult queries that that you guys might have mm. okay thank you very much that's very useful thank you thank you brilliant thank you nikki sir thank you martin for your question i uh, probably have time for one last question if there is one um i'm actually thinking of that just a reminder i've just put the link to the evaluation form into the chat box so please do complete that to um, get your certificate of attendance for today um, and for those asking where will the slides and the recording be available, uh, we have a YouTube channel. The, the link to that is um, included in the joining instructions email that you used to join today. So get all the information. Uh, we just try and get them up in within, within two weeks of the session. Um, any questions for uh, final offerings for questions for Nikki and Sarah before we close today's meeting? Okay, well, uh, Nikki, Nikki and Sarah are happy to, to take questions. So if, if you do have, if you do think of anything that you want to ask um, after the session is finished, please just drop us a line and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure it gets over to Nikki and Sarah for, for, for an answer for you. And with that said, um, just one last thank you to Nikki and Sarah for, for their time and expertise today. Um, and a, a huge thank you to all of you in the audience, um, a huge audience today. We really appreciate you um, sparing your dinner hours and your time um, to come and join us for these meetings um, and hope to see you at the next one. Thank you very much, everybody.